The next two methods of voting that I'd like to walk through are slightly different approaches to voting systems. When we took a look at plurality voting, plurality with runoff, and the instant runoff voting methods, those were all slight adaptations of the plurality system. The two methods that we're going to discuss here are just a little bit different in their nature, which is why I isolated them for a second video. However, I'm expecting that you've seen something similar to a board account before, and that's the method that I want to put into place here. So a board account is a system for attributing to points to the candidates in a voter profile based on their preferences. So for example, here we have five candidates, and what we would like to do is for the two voters over here with this voter profile say, we would like to give a lot of points to this person's first place candidate, four points in this situation, three points to their second place choice, candidate C in this example, two points to their third place choice, candidate D, one point to their fourth place choice, candidate B, and then no points to their last place choice. Now we could attribute a different collection of point values to these as long as your first place gets the most, second place gets less than that, third place gets less than that, and so on. But in a standard board account, if there are n candidates, the first place choice receives n minus one points all the way until the last place candidate receives zero points. Once we've attributed points to an individual voter's profile, we look at the whole voting populace and we count the total number of points that they've received from the voters. So if we want to walk through an example here, candidate A is the first choice of 18 different voters, and then candidate A is last place of every single other voter. That means that candidate A is going to receive 18 times 4 points, 18 people had candidate A as their top choice, which receives four points each, but then candidate A doesn't receive any other points for being in second, third, or fourth place, because candidate A is not in second, third, or fourth place for anyone else. So that's the most straightforward computation here for candidate A receiving 72 points. For the other candidates, and we'll do one more example, let's take a look at candidate C. Candidate C has 10 first place votes, so candidate C should get a total of 40 points for that. 10 times this candidate is a first place choice and receives four points for each of those first place votes. But then candidate C is the second choice of two different voter profiles, nine of these voter profiles and two of these voter profiles. So candidate C receives nine plus two or 11 second place votes and therefore gets three points apiece from those. So a total of 33 more votes here. Candidate C doesn't happen to be anybody's third place choice. So candidate C won't be receiving any votes that are worth two points apiece. But candidate C is a lot of people's fourth place choice. In fact, these 18 voters, these 12 voters, and these four voters view candidate C as their fourth place choice. So the last points that we'll attribute to candidate C are the 34 points for being a fourth place choice for a lot of candidates. So altogether we'll have 40 plus 33 plus 34, or a total of 107 points for candidate C. And we repeat that process for our other candidates, and I've made a little grid demonstrating how we've done that calculation for each of the candidates. And from that, you can see that candidate D has the highest point value when we've completed this process. So if we were to use board account voting on this voter profile, candidate D would be our winner. At least from the perspective of somebody in the United States, or if we want to go even further, you could say that this is my own personal experience when I was first learning social choice theory. Copeland's method, the method we'll discuss next, was the strangest method to me or the method that I hadn't seen before when learning about social choice. So I'd like to walk through this example with Copeland's method. However, it's a really important method to learn because it has a lot of strengths, which we'll see later on as we're analyzing these different voting systems. So what happens in Copeland's method is we look at all possible pairs of candidates 
And we imagine that we've conducted a lot of majority rules votes between each possible pair of candidates. So what I have over here on the left hand side is a chart where I've looked at all possible candidates and all possible candidates. And in this position right here, what we're going to record in that slot is what would happen if candidate A and candidate B face off in a head to head election where they are the only two possible candidates who would win in that situation. And that's what we're going to record in the chart. Notice that I've grayed out a lot of entries in the chart because a candidate can't face themselves in an election. That's not a situation we want to consider. And I haven't bothered filling in across the diagonals in this chart because an election between candidate A and B is the same as an election between candidate B and A. So I've only bothered filling in half this table. Because we have five candidates, what we want to envision is that there's actually five choose two or ten total head-to-head -head elections between all possible pairs of candidates. And what I've recorded in this table right here is who would win in that situation. Now candidate A at this point we've discussed at great length. Candidate A has a plurality of first place votes over here with these 18 voters with this voter profile, but candidate A is actually the last place choice of everybody else. So whenever candidate A faces any other candidate in a head-to-head -head election, candidate A is going to lose. So that's why we've got candidates B, C, D, and E going across here. In any head-to-head -head election, candidate A is guaranteed to lose. The only reason candidate A would win in a plurality voting system is because, in essence, these other candidates have split the vote. With the other pairings of candidates, it's not as straightforward, so I've just taken the time to highlight how the votes would go in each of the following situations here, 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 and here. For example, if we only have candidates B and C, we work down each voter profile and we circle the letter that comes before the other of the two candidates that are available. So here candidate B only has 16 votes, which is less than that needed 28 for a majority, so candidate C wins that election. A little bit of a closer call with candidates B and D, but B only gathers 26 votes under this system, so candidate D wins right here. Now the picture has switched around from here to here when we have candidate B versus candidate E, but you'll notice that the number of votes that candidate B receives when B is up against E has stayed the same at 26, so candidate E wins, and so on, and so forth doing that process, always figuring out who has the higher ranking and would therefore receive that collection of voters first place vote if these were the only two options that they had. When we're done now, we attribute one point to each candidate that we see in this table. In the event that we would have had a tie, we would have attributed a half a point to each of the candidates from the tie. But over here we don't see A occurring at all for zero points, B only occurs here once, C twice, D three times, and E four times. So we see that Copeland's method would rank the candidates as E is our top choice, D is our next best choice, candidate C is our third best choice, candidate B as our fourth choice, and candidate A is our last choice collectively. So candidate E would be our victor using Copeland's method, and in fact, candidate E is what's called a Condorcet victor. And what a Condorcet victor is, is a candidate that would have beaten every other candidate in a head-to-head -head comparison. So candidate E is a very strong candidate here. If candidate E were running in a two-party election with any one of these other candidates, candidate E would win that election. So candidate E would be called a Condorcet winner, and is in fact the victor using Copeland's method. Now the very last thing that I want to stress in this video is we're finished with this example now. These are all the methods that we are going to consider. There are more voting systems that you could create, all of which have their strengths and weaknesses. But overall what we saw from this example was that in fact with voter preferences like these, any one of the candidates could have won. Candidate A, B, C, D, or E. And so a lot of times it's very ambiguous who ought to win an election, and it depends on what your voting system is. However, what I think is important to be 
brought up right now is that this is a pencil and paper example that was created on purpose to demonstrate that effect to show you that different methods with the same collection of voter preferences can output a lot of different options. What normally happens when you have real election data that comes from a real populace is that you will see more trends. You may find two different voting systems that give two different answers for who ought to win that election, but more often than not, what you'll find is that something like four out of five of these methods agree on who the victor should be, and one method differs. And so in real life, it can be helpful to know about all of these different methods to feel confidence in the output of a voting system.